Meg Withget is going to talk to us about how to create our own future. She has a passion for learning, passion for linguistics, and truly is a remarkable genius. Please join me in welcoming Meg to the stage. Hello. <laughs> how many here are from out of town? Well, welcome to Silicon Valley, our really funny home. <laughs> what I'm wondering is, this morning, when we think of connectedness, why do we think of a web, you know, be it fiber optic strands or our social network? What is it about a web, you know? When did topology become important for metaphor? Do me a favor, humor me. Close your eyes and conjure up your image of the web. What does it look like? Is it floating in space, untethered to Earth? Rotate it. Is there a web under your web monitoring all that you do? <laughs> OK, you can open your eyes. Um, I think what we imagine for the future really matters. I, I, I believe this. I've had the unlikely good fortune to work in places where my job was to invent the future. Places such as Sun Microsystems, Interval Research, Xerox PARC. It was at PARC that Alan Kay famously proclaimed, the best way to invent the future, I'm sorry, the best way to predict the future, right, is to invent it, <laughs> right? People say, what was it like being there at Park in the 80s? Was it terrifying, you know, being a woman there? And I say, yeah, some days it was. <laughs> the first day I got there, I had to find where they hid the patch panel to, to connect to the evocatively called Ethernet. It was quite a, quite a special place. <laughs> but imagine, it was the most storied engineering environment on the planet. And here I was, just a young linguist. Yet, these remarkable people made me responsible for spiriting in this massively parallel computer from the future. It was called a connection machine. This thing had thousands of fairy lights connected to thousands of processors, literally blinking the message that many hands make light work. That's when my... Um, sense of connection changed forever. So, so connectedness, what is this connectedness? I asked three friends what they thought it meant. And um, one said, this is what you tell these TED people. <laughs> <laughs> I've got hardware out in the field. And when it's on the fritz, it calls me. So I can go fix it. And the customers don't even know, so I'm a hero. <laughs> Another one said, oh, here's what it is. I can look up anything, anywhere. It's like having the New York Public Library in the palm of my hand. That's connectedness. Another said, this is Steve Gundren, my uh, food inventor friend. He said, last week, I took a train from Santa Barbara to San Francisco, right? And I really, really wanted a pizza. And they don't serve pizza. So I, I got on the web, ordered one, San Luis Obispo, got off the train, got the pizza, got back on the train, that's connectedness. <laughs> <laughs> so what do all these examples have in common? Well, obviously superpowers. <laughs> we can use our connectedness to create impact in the world, right? It, it's simultaneously silly and exciting. Uh, but, you know, ours is not the first era of connectedness. Let, let's bracket our era and look backwards to the future. So imagine you're in Paris. The year is 1889. You see the Eiffel Tower, and it, it welcomes you to the World's Fair. So not all our dreams about connectedness kind of pan out. You'll see this. What you would have learned there is that the future would be about movement. There would be pneumatic tubes that would deliver pizza to you <laughs> and also be used for human transportation. Uh, 
in our country, um, communication, transportation got a lot of play too. Uh, so um, in the early 20th century, we dreamed up Route 66 stretching from Chicago to Santa Monica. And it was going to be the main street of America. So I, I guess the idea was that we could all feel like we belong to one small town. Um, a decade before that, it took five operators, 23 minutes to patch through the first call from New York to, to here in San Francisco. The nation was now wired for voice. But as 19th century's Henry David Thoreau said, you know, he, he wondered why? Why should we wire the nation? Um, he said, we're in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas. But Maine to Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1820, the Osage leader, big soldier, looked around and saw how we um, enslaved others, thus putting chains on ourselves. And he advocated links in right relationship. Very recently, the, the cultural critic, the writer um, um, Lewis Hyde um, said this, one of my favorite quotes. He says, the duty of the citizen in, in the cultural commons is to find right relationship between the private ego, the one that responds to the need and, and earns a paycheck, and the public ego, the one that receives from the given world and hopes to spread a banquet in return. So how are we doing? What's our legacy here? Um, I want to gesture to, to three groups of people who we often, I, I think, we overlook when we think about our era of connectedness. Early 70s, imagine this, there were isolated networks, um, like, like spider webs in the forest, um, each one slightly different. Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn created a protocol, what they called network glue, connecting these unlike um, networks so we could share. So enabling sharing, and also, by the way, enabling the internet. Um, 1985, um, as Thoreau said, there had to be something important to share across the land. Not far from Walden Pond, the computer scientist Richard Stallman invented the culture of free software. This has evolved, of course, into to what we know as open source. But equally important, he authorized computer scientists to share their vision as well as their code. Now, did anyone recognize this name, Catherine Ryan Hyde? Anybody? But I bet you know who she is. 1999, she wrote a really small book, but it's lodged in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's called Pay It Forward. Now you know, right? <laughs> um, so uh, Reid Hoffman from here <laughs> uh, writes well in the startup of you about this ethos, uh, about he contrasts old school networks that were transactional, what's in it for me, with this idealism of pay it forward that, that you see when, when you, you, you move here, where you provide a link for someone else only asking that their vision is supported. So that's some of the upside, I think, of our 40 year, um, our legacy, right? Um, others look forward in the future and um, they see dystopias, frankly. So they talk about standing at the shore and seeing plastic in the water all the way to the horizon. Or say, nine New York cities filled with kids in their 20s without jobs, without prospects. Um, there's a reason for their nightmares because sometimes we feel at the center of a gyre, right? Our legacy is mixed. Uh, in fact, the Pacific trash vortex is nearly as wide as Route 66 is long. And there's 75 million kids without a job, and that, you know, added up, equals roughly nine New York cities. So we can dream better than this. 
Um, is, there, is there a more telling metaphor for us going forward than the web? All around us are heroes, no matter where we live, right? And they're willing to sweep us into a future we hope to imagine. So hero is not too strong a, a word. Um, think back, if you're in Palo Alto, you know, really recently, you might have run across Sally Ride or, or Steve Jobs. And, and it's their, their hero's journey is at, for us, the, the level of the mythic, right? Um, if you doubt this, think back to University Avenue a year ago, to, to the flowers people put in front of the Apple store. And, and the post-it notes in the shop window, right? This reflected individual sense of sudden dislocation when their connection to Steve Jobs changed forever. M what's mythic ignites shared passion. Shared passion creates ripples, waves that travel great distances. So <laughs> when I look around, you know, actually, I get really optimistic because I'm very lucky I get to speak to young entrepreneurs pretty much every day. And um, this is what I glean from them. It's a, it's a recipe for dreaming up the future. You see, for us, we are told just to, to follow our bliss, just to follow our passion. But I think we know it's more than just about the disconnected individual, right? So here are four simple ingredients. Here's a cocktail for you. <laughs> so first ingredient, choose links, not chains. You know when you're in right relationship, right? Then um, cultivate the ability to support vision, particularly someone else's vision. You're going to need skills for this. It's worth it. Then belong to where you are. Being steeped in a place with others matters. That's how you're going to create waves from where you live. Because shared passion creates purpose. You're going to see these ingredients all, all throughout the day, I'm sure of this. Please, please look for them. Let me close with one example. Uh, SafeCast. They're currently crowd monitoring air pollution in, in Los Angeles. They arose out of the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. Scores of volunteers got together, created a global sensing network one week after the, the disaster. That's links, that's belonging, that's sharing a vision, that's sharing passion. So every generation makes a unique contribution. Look, be your own mixologist. I'm truly excited about trying your version. Thank you.